Good morning. Um, I'm Betsy O'Hagan, and I manage web and marketing for Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, a chapter of the National Audubon Society, and we're based in the Cleveland, Ohio, U.S. area. This morning, we have a lovely uh, opportunity to learn much more about the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia. And we are also are going to meet Katie Fallon, who is co-founder of the center and a nonprofit organization located near Morgantown, West Virginia. Good morning, Katie, and thank you so much for taking the time today to give us a mini tour and introduce us to some of your guests. Well, thank you very much, Betsy. Um, I'm excited to be here, and uh, I'm thankful to Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society for um, helping us out, um, spreading the word about the work we do for uh, our bird friends. And this is um, one of my this is uh, one of my bird friends. Um, her name is uh, Cheryl, and she is, of course, a crow. Um, she's an American crow. Um, she's uh, not releasable, so Cheryl, unfortunately, um, won't be uh, won't be able to return to the wild, which is why I'm interacting with her like this and kind of petting her. Um, I wouldn't interact like this with a bird that we were hoping to return to the wild. So um, Cheryl was probably hit by a vehicle when she was a very young fledgling. So she had just left her nest probably and um, was hit by a car very soon after. Uh, and she had two broken bones in um, a wing. And unfortunately, uh, the bones, young bird bones, heal very, very quickly. Uh, the bones were already healing when she came to us. So we weren't able to uh, fix them in any way. So he's stuck with us. Uh, she's an educational ambassador, so her job now is to teach people about American crows uh, and all the great things they do for ecosystems and just how amazing they are. Hello. And you might not be able to hear her, but Cheryl does say hello um, very quietly. Uh, so since, since she... Hello. Hello. Since she was such a young bird, uh, when she came to us, so we knew that she wasn't going to be able to return to the wild. Uh, we didn't wor we didn't worry about um, getting her accustomed to people. Mostly, most often when young birds come in uh, and we want to return them to the wild, we are very careful to minimize interaction with wild birds because we want them to retain their wildness. Cheryl, um, since she was she's listening to the owl that's next to us. But uh, Cheryl, since we knew she wasn't going to be able to return to the wild, we went ahead and uh, talked to her and snuggled her and um, got her accustomed to people since she's going to be stuck with people for the rest of her life. Um, so uh, American crows, you might know, are uh, considered very, very intelligent birds, um, very intelligent species like all the members of the, the, the Corvid family. What Cheryl just did there is called rousing. She kind of shimmies a little bit, shakes all of her feathers out. Um, it's a sign of comfort in, in birds in captive situations, but it, it, birds do it in the wild too when they want to get their feathers all in the right spot. Um, anyway, American crows, along with their relatives, uh, ravens, magpies, blue jays, um, rooks. They're all members of the Corvid family and they are very smart birds. So if someone calls you a bird brain, um, you can take it as a compliment because some of these birds are very intelligent. Some Corvids have been known to use tools um, to, to bend paper clips to be able to fit them into toys to get pieces of food out. Uh, that's a behavior that's considered to be um, a trait of intelligence, a mark of intelligence if, if you can use tools. So you might hear some traffic noise in the background. 
Uh, there also are two turkey vultures um, in the enclosure with us. So if you see Cheryl looking around, she's watching the vultures that are kind of above her. Or she's listening to the traffic sounds. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, Cheryl? Uh, crows are uh, very recognizable, very recognizable um, species. Most people can recognize a crow. Uh, Blackbird, smaller than a raven. Here in the eastern U.S., they're usually more common than ravens, although out west, um, ravens in some parts of the west, ravens are more common. Um, crows eat a wide variety of foods. Um, they will scavenge, they'll eat carrion. Cheryl loves when she, um, when we are, we have some friends who are bow hunters who will donate pieces of their archery killed deer. It has to be archery killed because the birds are susceptible to lead poisoning. Um, so we only want deer that's been um, not shot with lead. But anyway, Cheryl um, loves it when we get little little bits of archery killed deer. Um, and the vultures love that also. So in the wild, they would scavenge. Um, they would also eat uh, small animals, um, insects, worms, uh, crayfish, things like that. Um, they'll eat eggs. They'll eat baby birds in a nest, which, which no one likes to hear that, right, Cheryl? But they will uh, sometimes eat nestling birds. Um, they'll eat fruit. Um, they'll eat corn. They'll eat your vegetable garden. Uh, of course, the scarecrow, right, is, is, um, comes from the crow's uh, habit of sometimes eating your garden. Um, I don't mind if Cheryl comes to my house and eats my garden, though. No, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. Um, uh, so a very wide variety of food, insects, fruits, vegetables, um, other invertebrates, um, other birds, uh, eggs, mice, scavenging, very wide variety. Um, crows also in the wild have been known to recognize individual humans, uh, humans that they might see very often, uh, or humans that um, harass them they also will learn that also. So uh, if you have neighborhood crows around, um, you, they, they probably know you um, just like you know them. So, and Cheryl does have some, some of our uh, volunteers and folks here at ACCA uh, who she prefers over other folks. Um, there are some people she's a little bit afraid of for whatever reason, and then some people um, who she has a pretty strong connection with. Uh, and I, I think that we have a pretty strong connection. I think that she's um, uh, a little, a little sweetheart. Um, I love her very much. So, if you want to see Cheryl eat for lunch, um, I'd be happy to go and um, grab her food for her. That uh, would she be great. Okay. She might fly around for a second while I open the door. Okay, um, we'll wait. We'll be here. But it's only going to take me a second. Sometimes when I stand up, she she doesn't like it. But I'm going to grab her food. Yeah, hello. I'm going to grab your food for you, honey. And sh come on back down here, buddy. And Cheryl's lunch today is delicious. I think you can see it. It's, there's some hard-boiled egg. There are some uh, mouse pieces. There are some mealworms, some wax worms, some dried fruit. She uh, looks eager to get at it. <laughs> she is. So she usually goes, oh, she went for a peanut first. She also loves, mostly waxworms are her favorite. You'll notice that she is putting them in this, uh, on this stump. She has this stump all torn apart. Um, and she will sometimes save little pieces of food for later. Uh, you can hear, you might be able to hear Lou, the turkey vulture, sort of yelling at me because he sees that Cheryl's getting fed and he um, <laughs> also wants to be fed. Uh, but crows will cache their food. Uh, in, in the wild, you know, and when they're in human care, um, which means they'll hide little bits and they'll come back for it later. Uh, you might see blue jays doing this too. If you have blue jays by your bird feeder, they'll sometimes uh, bury some peanuts or uh, seeds in the yard um, that they'll go back for later. Um, woodpeckers will sometimes do this. I have a red-bellied woodpecker, not related to crows, but uh, I have a red-bellied woodpecker at home who um, I uh, 
my piece of the food in my gutter, which is great. <laughs> Uh, but but Cheryl has little spots all around the enclosure where she will stick pieces of food under some leaves or under some uh, some gravel, and she'll go back and get those later. And sometimes, what what you just saw her do, wiping her beak. Um, the term for that is um, speaking, F E K E, I think. Uh, how you spell that? And it's it's when the birds wipe their faces off um, to clean them. You'll notice, too, Cheryl's a very good-looking bird, if I may say so. Uh, she's got very, feathers are in great condition, very sleek. Um, she spends uh, quite a bit of time preening those feathers. Um, she bathes. Um, there, she ate a mealworm. Um, she likes those. But she, she also likes to dump her food bowl sometimes and kind of make a mess. That's what she's trying to, kind of trying to do here a little bit. Usually when she eats hard-boiled eggs, she likes to eat the yellow part first, just like my kids. But she thinks, she thinks oh, you're going to bite me? She says, put that down. Put that down. <laughs> I, I also eat the yellow part first. <laughs> she's so sweet. <laughs> she's, a, she's a great little bird. Um, she's wonderful. Crows tend to be um, a little bit, at least my understanding, in, in captive situations, they can be a little bit nervous about new things. So Cheryl mostly does um, on-site presentations for us, uh, and she doesn't travel too much yet. We hope that she will. Uh, honestly, though, we haven't been traveling to do programs very much either um, in this time of the pandemic. Um, so doing presentations like this are, are great. Uh, it lets people see our birds um, without having to uh, travel around and risk, risk, um, risk take the health risk. Uh, but, but crows sometimes are a little bit shy of new things. So if we have a new volunteer coming in to feed the birds, Cheryl sometimes will get a little bit, a little bit antsy about that. Um, or if we introduce a new object to her enclosure, she sometimes is a little bit nervous about it. Um, a bird I'm going to show you in, um, in a few minutes here when we finish with Cheryl. Uh, I'm going to show you a black vulture that we have. Um, and this, the black vulture loves to investigate new objects. We give him a new object and he almost immediately run to it and grab it with his beak and, and play with it and look under it and investigate it. Um, where Cheryl is, uh, she's um, above me now in the perch. Let me see if I can. <laughs> we, can, we can see her just a little bit now. Yes, and she's flown to the other side. Yep, she's over there. She's um cleaning off her beak again. Uh, so maybe I'll leave Cheryl her food, and I'll go show you um, the black vulture, uh, who hopefully will um, uh, cooperate with us and um, demonstrate how he plays with his toys. So Katie, here, Katie, before you do that, oh, sure. um, I want to see uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, I know I have one. Sure. Um, so how old is Cheryl? She is only two years old. Oh, okay. So she, right. hashed, she hashed in 2018. I uh, see. She's just a little bit over two. I um, really am marveling at her um, her social her social mannerisms, especially with you. She um, uh, she reminds me of of uh, a dog I have that is is very sweet, and um, yeah, it's it's uh, really interesting to watch her and to see how she um, eats and how she is in relationship to you. Um, yeah, yeah. We're, um, we're, I, I think it's fascinating to see what she chooses first. You yeah. know, the delicious um, lunch tray here. Right. Well, uh, um, can you tell us about how much does just a single bird like Cheryl eat every year, and and cool. how does how do you manage that at the center? Um, do you have volunteers? Um, do you do you, are, I know that the center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And then how how long how long has the center been open? 
how do, how do you manage? Uh, these are very demanding husbandry uh, caring that needs to go on every day. And yeah. you must have the supplies for uh, the birds. Um, I know whenever an animal is domesticated, or we have to take on responsibility. And we're, it's a big responsibility for their life. Can right. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yes, I mean, it's, um, it's a responsibility that we take seriously. So we'll, we plan to have Cheryl um, you know, for the rest of her life. And, and she, she just, I don't know if you, anybody can see that, but she took two nuts and she ran away with them. And she is hiding them under some leaves right now. But oh. it's a little tough to get that behavior on video because she doesn't want me to see. You know. Sure. <laughs> well, what, what, is, what is her life expectancy? Now, we're just talking about Cheryl, this individual, one single animal. Yes. Yeah. So birds, interestingly, live longer than mammals, often will live longer of mammals of the same size. And birds under human care um, do tend to live longer than uh, their wild wild counterparts. And we're, I'm trying to see where Cheryl went behind me. Um, are you back? Do you want some more of your stuff? Uh, you also um, asked about food a second ago. Before I forget, I want to talk about all the different things that Cheryl is eating here and how yes. people can um, donate these items. Um, so we have a, a wish list on Amazon um, and a wish list that, um, that Betsy had that you can, you can order mealworms and waxworms and have them shipped right to us. And we always need them. Um, we have never had too many mealworms and waxworms. Uh, and in addition to Cheryl, um, many birds eat waxworms and mealworms, especially in the spring. I don't know how many tens or hundreds of thousands of waxworms we went through this summer, but most uh, songbirds that we treat eat mealworms or waxworms. Uh, and you can order them by, you know, the hundred or by the thousand. We order, we have, um, we usually order them, you know, one or two thousand at a time. Wow. With mealworms and waxworms, we usually get 200. Uh, 250 at a time, and um, screech owls eat, eat mealworms also. So in the winter, when our songbirds, we get fewer songbirds in in the winter time, but we can still uh, screech owls, American kestrels, barred owls, um, crows, blue jays that are here all winter. You know, we will, we still go through a lot of mealworms and waxworms. It's not something that people often think about donating, though. People think. Uh, you know, live, sending live, shipping live insects to a rehab organization. Um, I don't think it's something that comes to mind usually, but it's very, very helpful. Uh, if people would donate us insects, we would love it. Cheryl also, also eats, you can see um, there's these dried bananas in here, um, oh. dried, dried cranberries. There's uh, little like coconut bits. So this is a, uh, here's some more, more dried fruit. She also eats a vegan, keto, diet-friendly, um, organic trail mix. Oh, wonderful. Can you hold up her plate just a little bit for us to see it? Yeah. And what, what, is, um, what, what is the large, larger red piece just above the egg on, toward your thumb? Oh, that's a mouse. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so she also will eat mice. So oh, uh, all right. many of our birds... Um, uh, eat mice. So, so the mice that we're seeing right now, if you hold that up again, I'm sorry, it's just out of the reach of the camera. That's good. Um, so it's a really, it's, an, it's easy to donate uh, these well, essential food items to keep the animals going. So mice that we get, um, we love gift certificates from yes. uh, Rodent Pro, uh, which is where we get uh, most of our mice and our rats and quail and chicks. Um, RodentPro.com uh, has a way you can email us um, gift certificates. We will probably spend, I, I, I don't have the exact number yet, but we're probably going to end up spending close to $13,000 this year on uh, from RodentPro. <laughs> uh, and that's only one supplier of food. 
Yes. I'm yeah. sure you have multiple suppliers. So fundraising is critical. Yes. Yeah. Um, that I've heard that. And, and I yeah. hope later on in your presentation you'll also tell us about uh, the need and the um, importance of volunteers. But I, yeah. if I may, I think we may have a question. Let me okay. check. Uh, Gloria, do you have a question that you would like to ask, Katie? And you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, really? Thank you. Oh, I muted myself back. Um, actually, my question was going to be how how long is Cheryl's life expectancy? And I wanted to know what was in her food bowl as, as well. And as far as her not wanting to eat in front of an audience, I, I kind of get that. <laughs> it's kind of a private thing to do, you know, but uh, she does seem very, very intelligent. Does she um, interact socially in a different, you said that he, she seems to gravitate to certain people, you know, it's probably just something she feels just like people do. But does she socially interact with those that she kind of feels more comfortable with uh, more and do some of the kind of she is she she's not very wild. She seems to be uh, very domesticated and it, it's kind of cool, you know. <laughs> yeah, she's so she does she she probably um uh, I would say I'm not sure um, if she interacts quite the same manner uh, with with every all the humans who come in here. Uh, I think she probably um, is more snuggly with me than with uh, with most people. I, I usually um, kind of feed her and play with her and snuggle her, and I don't I don't make her work very hard. Um, we have another. Uh, Betsy asked about volunteers. We have about we have about 30 to 40 volunteers to take care of the birds, um, and we have one part-time employee. Um, and the, the our one part-time employee works primarily with the education birds and with um, making sure the birds have a consistent one consistent person to come in and work with them um, several times a week. So she makes Cheryl work a little bit more than I do, um, and I'm mostly the snuggly uh, lovey person. Um, so uh, Cheyenne, um, who works with her, uh, also uh, works more on training her to go into a travel carrier, training her to jump onto different perches, um, and I mostly train her to snuggle with me. So, uh, which is, you know, enriching, um, enrichment is something that is really important for um, animals under human care. Uh, the birds are not able to do what they would be doing in the wild. Um, there would be, uh, you know, a lot of their time would be spent searching for food, um, interacting with their, their mate or their, or their chicks or their young, um, migrating. Uh, and our birds under human care don't really be able to do, they aren't really able to do that. So enrichment is something really important. So Cheyenne also works to provide enrichment for the birds. And interacting with different people like this is enriching for Cheryl. And getting these different kinds of foods is also enriching. Um, she gets to kind of choose what she wants to eat. Um, she gets to, uh, you know, hide the food from her roommates, um, who I should stand up and show you in a second here. Uh, she gets to interact with different items. Um, and she, she does have some toys and, and stuff around here. But... Uh, yeah, so I probably snuggle her more than other more than other people. Um, but let me let me show you her roommates, and I want to show you. Speaking of enrichment, I definitely want to show you um, this other bird that, that I'm going to have out in the hallway here in a second. But and there might be some vulture poop that you will see. Um, ah, that's Ooh. okay. Yeah, yes, sure. now we can see some of the other birds in the ca in the the um, containment. Yeah, so these are, um, this is uh, Lou over here, and again, sorry about the vulture poop, they go to the bathroom a lot. Um, this is Lou, and then up high uh, in the corner over here is Boris, and Boris is doing some preening. Um, vultures spend a lot of time preening also. Um, they're not dirty, they're very clean birds. 
they clean up our ecosystems um, and they remove dead animals um, that could otherwise contaminate the landscape. And Boris is just posing for us um, beautifully right now. And Lou over here is saying, where's my food? You brought that crow food and where's mine? And he's kind of woof woofing at me right now. <laughs> um, and uh, Lou was hit by a vehicle and can't fly enough, well enough to return to the wild. And um, where did Boris go? And Boris was shot. Uh, and unfortunately, um, she can't fly well enough to return to the wild either. Um, it's, of course, against federal law to... Oh, and Lou just gave us a nice grouse. Um, he just shook all of his feathers, getting everything... Um, all the feathers where they're supposed to be. Uh, shooting um, a turkey vulture uh, is against federal law. Um, they are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And they are very, very important birds to have in the ecosystem because of the ecosystem services they provide. So I want to walk with you for a second to meet another vulture, if that's okay. We'll say, we'll say bye to Cheryl. Bye, Cheryl. I'm um, trying not to make you too seasick um, <laughs> by, by moving this around. But um, here I am out here, and I'm going to put my... I'm going to put my mask on, too, because Cheyenne is going to join us. I don't want to give her coronavirus, even though I, I think we're both fine. But we're going to be safe. And Cheyenne is going to um, help introduce us to our next friend. And I think the camera is probably in an okay place, but maybe I'll even come down on the ground. Yeah, I'll come down here. All right. Hi, that's um, Jeff the Barred Owl right here. Uh, Very good. He's, he's not as cool as Maverick, though, in my opinion. So, let's see. If that's we a have good some, view, a good camera view. Good camera view, excellent. So you good can, morning, Cheyenne. Good morning. <laughs> or good afternoon. Yeah, so Cheyenne is our, is our bird trainer um, that I just mentioned. She's the one who uh, um, she's the one who makes Cheryl work uh, more than I do. Uh, so you can so you can all see the vulture now, right? Yes. Yep. So this is Maverick, the black vulture. Uh, Maverick was also hit by a vehicle and can't fly well enough to return to the wild. So his important job is to teach people about vultures. And you can see him just playing with a toy. He just found a mouse that was hidden in a toy. And Cheyenne has this uh, hallway all set up here for him. And then he can go down to the end and he can say hi to Cheryl if he wants to. Um, that that uh, table is right outside the enclosure of Cheryl and Lou and Boris. So now you might get to see Maverick um, try to figure out this puzzle theater. And it doesn't take him very long, and some of his food is hidden underneath the uh, little plastic feet. This is, you know, mostly for, for dogs. They probably didn't design this with black vultures in mind, but um, it doesn't take Maverick very long to, uh, to figure, out, figure out how to get those yellow things out to eat the, eat the mice. Katie, can I ask you about um, how, does he, how does he find the food? How does he know to pull that apart? Has he done that before, and can he smell the food? How does he locate it? So um, black vultures have excellent eyesight. Uh, they probably don't have a very good sense of smell. However, turkey vultures do have an excellent sense of smell. And in the wild, um, turkey vultures, uh, black vultures might follow turkey vultures to food. Um, and then sort of chase them away from, chase them away from the food uh, once they find it. So, let's see, Maggie's going to come up here and, and he's going to eat some out of right for the camera here for you. So well, we can thing. see how beautiful he is. He is gorgeous. Uh, again, people sometimes think vultures are dirty or or sneaky or they have a bad reputation, and he's none of those things. I mean, he keeps himself in um, excellent shape. Uh, he's got, you know, beautiful feathers, um, and you'll notice, too, that you, you ask how he knows um, how the food is in these things. So he does know that, that uh, 
you know, we hide food around here for him. Yes. But he also is just very, he's always exploring with his beak. Um, he's uh, very curious about uh, putting his beak into things, um, mm -hmm. exploring, uh, moving things around to try to find food. And he's, he's hopeful that he's got more food underneath there. And Cheyenne sometimes will hide food underneath the leaves for him, so he's um, flipping them over. And, of course, as you can see that uh, plastic plastic balls in that container, we'll sometimes hide food in that. Um, oh, he says, what's this pile of leaves? <laughs> can, oh, you tell us, can you tell us uh, how old is he? Uh, what is his life expectancy? And, and I'm curious, because we have to be so remote and distant now, can you help us to get a good idea about how much he weighs? Sure. So um, the life expectancy for a black vulture, I have to, I probably have to look it up to tell you exactly the, whatever the record is right now. But I would, I think it's about 12 or 14 years in the wild. But I'm not sure that we really know that answer because you can't tell how old a black vulture is by looking at it. Uh, the only way we would get age data is if the bird was tagged in some way. Um, so if you tag a black vulture in the nest, for example, um, and then you recite that bird years later uh, or keep track of that bird as a transmitter, then you would, you would be able to figure out its age. So um, turkey vultures, uh, the record in the wild is similar. I think it's 14 years. However, under human care, there are turkey vultures um, that have lived into their early 40s. Um, and there are uh, many that I, or several that I know of, that are in their 30s. So I suspect that in the wild, we're going to learn that turkey vultures and black vultures live longer than we think they do, um, as we have more birds with uh, transmitters and tags on them. So Maverick, we're, we're not sure exactly how old Maverick is, we think that he was a young bird when he came to us in uh, 2014. We think he was um, young then. Uh, but we, we <laughs> Maverick's like, oh, I see you have a mouse, Cheyenne. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, the last time that Maverick was weighed, I think you asked about weight. The last time he was weighed, I think he was about 1,600 grams. Is that right, Cheyenne? 1,600 grams. Yes. So, so for, for the layman um, and who is not so um, familiar with the different measurements in weight, what, what kind of a household object weight would that be comparable to? Um, nobody got that. Uh, 1,600 grams. Um, oh, this is math you're asking me to do, Betsy. <laughs> um, I think that's about... I think it's about four pounds. Okay. All right. That gives us uh, a better idea. Yeah, I, I got used to um, weighing the birds in grams and weighing the food in grams, and it makes more logical sense to me than um, <laughs> sure. ounces and pounds. Uh, I think Cheyenne's going to do the math here. Uh, I want to say it's about four pounds. Turkey vultures and black vultures are similar in weight. Um, here in the eastern U.S., our turkey vultures seem to weigh more than black vultures. But there are different subspecies, like three pounds, three and a half pounds. So if Maverick weighs about three and a half pounds. So if you think of um, uh, what else weighs three and a half pounds, like a, a small cat maybe, right? Yeah. Um, birds have hollow bones. So even though Maverick looks big, um, he's got a, about a, if his wings both worked properly, um, it would be about a five foot four or five foot wingspan, um, but they're, they're very light. You know, they're built for, they have to be light to fly. One of the reasons that humans can't fly is that uh, we have heavy bones. <laughs> mm. We don't have these um, wonderful hollow bones um, designed to fly. Um, black vultures are again, one of my favorite species. They are found um, mostly in the southern United States, although they are pushing for uh, pushing further and further north. They show up further north um, on like uh, Christmas bird counts and on eBird, uh, but they are primarily a southern bird. Uh, so there's nothing else in He wants to check his little cup to make sure he doesn't forget anything. 
<laughs> oh, no, there, little buddy. Well, may I ask um, for if uh, in uh, times that are not socially distanced, and in in the past at your center, the recent recent past. How many um, do you uh, do the birds? You mentioned educational programs. Can you tell us a little bit about how the center serves its its uh, surrounding community and um, and um, educates uh, the public and youth about about these wonderful birds and the good work that you do? Sure. So in real life, um, not pandemic life. Yes. Um, we do. Um, we do programs for uh, really any group um, who wants, who's interested in a program. We go to a lot of schools, um, especially elementary schools. We're in the same, we're very close to West Virginia University, so we visit a lot of university classes also, wildlife classes, biology classes. Um, I sometimes teach creative writing, and uh, I teach very part-time at WVU, I should say. Um, and I've brought the birds to my creative writing classes before. Um, and had students write about them. Um, so, uh, oh, we also do uh, 4-H camps, Girl Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, festivals, um, where we go to a great festival called the Cheat River Festival. Um, every year they can have it. That's uh, to raise awareness about watershed health. Um, Audubon groups, other bird clubs. Um, really, we do any anybody who wants a program, um, we'll do. We, we usually talk about uh, why conserving wild birds is important. Um, it's important for all, all kinds of reasons. We talk about the natural history of the bird species that we bring. If we go to a school, uh, we usually bring two or three birds, and that's primarily because that's all the carriers we can fit in our vehicles. Something that we, that's in our long-term plan, uh, is to get a van that we can take to educational programs. Um, a van, uh, something like a Ford Transit uh, or that, that size vehicle, or even a, even an SUV that we could fit more bird carriers in, um, then we wouldn't have to take our personal vehicles. Um, some of the birds travel a lot better than others. Uh, our peregrine falcon, um, our screech owls, uh, our red-tailed hawk, our cooper's hawk go off-site to do programs, uh, but Maverick um, the, and Cheryl and the vultures tend to do more programs on site. Uh, we can't we can't accommodate large groups, but we can accommodate uh, small small groups or families um, again in normal times who want to come and visit the bird. Uh, we have some lab groups from WVU who come every every year uh, and. Um, Learn about the bird education birds that we have here on site. Well, we it, hope sounds, it sounds as if you do so much. Um, I want to check and see. Um, we have one other person viewing here. Gloria, do you have any other questions at this point? I was just wondering. Um, Katie said that uh, the black vultures are usually southern birds. Are they concentrated? Uh, in the, the mountains or along interstates or where do you find the black vultures in the south? Where's their, I guess, their hunting grounds? The black vultures um, are interesting, very interesting and sort of unique in that they make use of human, uh, human homes and cities and uh, businesses and farms. Black vultures uh, don't mind being around people, which is good for them in some ways, but also to their detriment in some ways, because some people don't like them, um, surprisingly. Uh, black vultures have been known to um, gather on roofs of homes, schools, <laughs> businesses. Uh, they also tend to hang out um, near farms where, live, where um, carcasses are disposed of on site. Uh, they um, will hang out sometimes by uh, slaughterhouses or garbage dumps or open dumpsters or areas where people are feeding um, outdoor cats or dogs uh, or zoos sometimes will have a lot of wild black vultures 
hanging out on the zoo grounds, um, eating the food that's intended for the zoo animals. And this is something that they've done. Uh, John James Audubon, when he was writing about uh, bird species in America, uh, his black vulture species account is fascinating. That he may, he notes that black vultures are found um, all about, you know, cities, um, in slaughterhouses, following trucks with dead, car dead animal carcasses on them. Um, you know, eating things that the butchers throw out. Uh, so. And it's still true today that black vultures can sometimes be found right around people. And sometimes people are scared of them because I guess Maverick is scary if you don't know him. Um, but once you know him, you can't help but love him. Uh, of course, if you have 100 black vultures on your roof all pooping, um, that can cause some damage. Uh, but, but they are um, uh, primarily, and some, someone was making a... Uh, uh, someone was causing a fuss down there. Um, oh, and Maverick is saying, I'm quite certain there are more mice in here. Uh, where are the mice? Where are the mice? Um, um, Excuse anyway, me, that was my dog. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No, I got, I got distracted here uh, from answering my question. I forget what I was saying, but... Um, Anyway, black vultures, uh, there are, again, primarily southern species, but we do have them here in West Virginia um, year-round now. But the majority of the world's black vultures live in the tropics. Uh, so it's, it's probably 90% of the world's black vultures live in Central and South America, and only about 10% um, of the world's black vultures live in North America. So they are not just a southern species, but a tropical species. Um, that is pushed north. Uh, turkey vultures are similar. We probably have about 70% of the world's turkey vultures in North America, or sorry, 70% of the world's turkey vultures live in Central and South America, and about 30% live in North America. So well, both of them, as both if I may, may say, uh, WCAS does uh, a lot of work um, in uh, learning uh, much more about urban birding and ah. helping the public to become more aware of the birds and the habitat that surrounds them in metropolitan areas. And this we have to thank uh, our UK celebrity birder, David Lindo, who is otherwise known as the urban birder. Um, oh, but um, so this bird that you've introduced introduced us to is one that we need to pay attention to and one that yeah. we can learn a lot more about and um, and and welcome and uh, help our neighbors learn more about. Yes, I mean, they clean up our mess. Um, black vultures and turkey vultures and other scavengers, uh, scav bird, avian scavengers are very efficient removing carcasses. Um, they're more efficient than mammalian scavengers. They help stop the spread of rabies. Um, they can eat animals that uh, have died of um, anthrax or uh, botulism toxin. Uh, they can neutralize those diseases. If they eat an animal that's died of anthrax, um, there's not any trace of anthrax in the vultures dropping. Wow, what, what, a, what an incredible natural safety net. Yes. They, they are really good to have, have um, public health-wise. Um, it's not something we think about very often, but, uh, you know, scavengers are very important to clean up, clean up everything. Um, and if you leave, uh, you know, a dumpster open or a, a landfill um, where there's food matter, I mean, scavengers will come and help get rid of that food matter. Black vultures, interestingly, will eat not just um, dead animals, but they will also eat uh, vegetables and fruit. They'll eat pumpkins. They'll eat watermelons. They'll even eat um, manure, like horse and cow manure. Um, they'll eat dog food and cat food. Uh, you get Maverick likes hard-boiled eggs. You saw him eating some hard-boiled eggs. Um, they eat more than just carrion. It's kind of an interesting kind of interesting. So sometimes people will, uh, 
you know, wonder why they're, if they're eating food in a dumpster, uh, I mean, they'll eat meat that's, that's been thrown away. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll scavenge. They make good use of uh, human subsidies. Very interesting. Well, we can see how much is needed and, well, more importantly, how much goes into um, knowing about all of the different avian species and particularly your resident birds. Uh, we can only imagine how much must be done and known to be able to care for visitors and patients recuperating. I hope that we get to come back and learn more about about the work that the center does and perhaps other aspects of it as well. I just I just wanted to say Katie, I think that <clears throat> that ending this conversation on the fact that what vultures and other scavenger avian species do for the environment and for humans is very, very important because um, <clears throat> as we know, they were not picking up dead animals along the highways the way they used to do, the, you know, sanitation crews. So to have this natural way of, of doing away with things that can cause disease after they die um, is a really great thing. And then I think the really important thing is to stress that these birds take away those potential bacteria and um, rabies and things like that that could cause disease in other animals or in humans. So I think sometimes that gets lost and people have a tendency to think of that vultures vomit more or, or something, but it's important to know that that vomit isn't uh, harmful in any way. Um, and I think you do, your center does a really great job of doing that. And I just want to plug your book, uh, Vulture, the, um, Private life of an unloved bird is just really, really a fascinating, fascinating read. And um, so I'm looking forward to having you come for our book discussion on Sunday and hear what your favorite uh, books are about nature and birds. So, and thanks so much for doing this. Um, it's really thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much um, for having us. And thank you for um, the kind words about my book. Um, I love talking about vultures, and I talk about them uh, to anyone who will listen. Um, they are just uh, amazing birds that have an unfortunate reputation. Um, and something else um, that you can all see here, uh, we, work, we work really hard to make sure that the, our non-releasable birds have the best lives that they can, even though they can't return to the wild. Um, and uh, just how important, um, you know, enriching these birds' lives are. Uh, it's really important to us that our, our ambassador birds have um, the opportunity to uh, interact with um, different people and, um, you know, explore things like, like have you, you know, have, seeing Maverick go through his, uh, you know, dog, dog puzzle. Um, is, is just is really uh, amazing. I think if more people knew vultures and knew how curious they were and how smart and how important they were for the ecosystem, um, they would have a lot more friends. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity um, to talk today about these, some of our uh, really cool birds that, that we're very privileged and fortunate to get to hang out with. Well, thank you, Katie. It's the pleasure has been all ours, and we look forward to coming back again very soon. Uh, and uh, I also want to let folks know that um, you can learn much more about um, the Avian C Conservation Center of Appalachia at the wcaudubon.org website as well as there are plenty of links there in the various stories.
um, to uh, donate. Um, and I would like to also mention that really the best way to donate, um, a place where you can go anytime and donate directly, is just go, go to the Avian Conservation Center of Appalachia website. And that address is accawv.org and go to the contact page. And there's a very easy to identify, easy to locate PayPal donate button there. Uh, at the WC Audubon website, we do have uh, the list uh, um, of needed supplies and materials. But, but don't, you don't even have to see that. I would just, if I were you, just go to the donate page at accawv.org. It's the. It's actually called the contact page, uh, and go go to that donate PayPal button and make a donation. Every donation counts, and um, to help people who are working hard to support um, and even enrich the lives of avians and various birds, whether they are patients and in recovery or they are, are working residents, helping youth and the public to learn much more about nature. So thank you so much, Katie, and we will see you again very soon. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, um, we're, we appreciate your efforts a lot. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, you too.